Hey yo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. A couple of really strong promos were the backbone of tonight's episode of SmackDown as the WWE made history bringing us the blue brand live from a very controversial Cleveland, Ohio, as well as the Rolling Loud Festival. And I don't like to be loud when I'm rolling. I'm actually a very quiet roller, if I'm being honest. But it wasn't very quiet tonight on SmackDown. A pretty decent and enjoyable episode, and there is always something wrong with it. And that's exactly what we are here to talk about. So let's bring the hammer down on this episode right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare. You are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's SmackDown Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. Well, tonight's episode was enjoyable. There is always something wrong with this show. So let's start off by saying I don't understand what they're doing with our least favorite WWE superstar, Constable Dickhead himself, Baron Corbin. Now, I hate anything that involves this guy generally, but what they're doing right now with this sad sap, this, this sack of shit version of Corbin that down on his luck and can't catch a break, it's not producing any emotions in me whatsoever. I don't feel bad for this guy. I don't feel anything for this guy whatsoever. However, it did produce something tonight that I think will go down in the annals of time as one of the single greatest moments of SmackDown. And I just have to share it with you because it is my, my favorite thing. Not the good promos, not the couple of decent matches. No, this, ladies and gentlemen, was my favorite moment of tonight's SmackDown. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, I love it. It was glorious. It just came out of nowhere, and that's just how bad this is. But to, to make matters worse, Constable King, former Constable King dickhead Baron Corbin, prior to getting his nuts blown off by Shotzi and Noxy with their little tank, he gets a handout from Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens gives this guy some money because Kevin Owens is a decent human being. He reached down into his soul and into his heart and he said, you know what, let me give this piece of crap Corbin a little, a little chip, just a little something to maybe get him back on his feet. And then Corbin gets this shot in the nuts, which we're going to watch again. <laughs> it's glorious. It's beautiful. <laughs> Probably the single best thing Shotzi and Noxy are going to do on the main roster. So he gets shot in the nuts. Not five times. It was only once. But, you know, I had to make it better than it was. And then he gets mugged. He gets robbed by the dirty dogs. Being as dirty and as doggy as they ever could possibly be. Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode were on this show a couple of times tonight. But in this case, they came to kick a man while he's down, take his money, and make Constable Corbin even more pathetic than he's ever been before. And I'm here to tell you that I don't give two shits. I don't care. But it did make me laugh. Seeing Corbin get hit in the nuts with that rocket was just one of the highlights of this night. Another one of the highlights of this night was our old friend Apple Do here. Brrr, Apple Do John Cena. Bing, 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 bing. See, we can see him because he started off SmackDown in the usual John Cena way. And John Cena came out and he got the crowd all hyped up. I'm here to hype up the crowd, y'all. And you can't see my hat because the colors I wear are so green that people that use green screens can't effectively use any of my merchandise. So that's why you can't see my hat. But you can see me. And I'm here. And I'm going to give a promo like I always do. And I'm going to ask you what team you're on. And I'm going to say, are you on Team Cena? And the crowd's going to be like, <sighs> He says, you going to be on the crowd, Roman Re Team Roman Reigns. And the crowd's like, Boo. So everything is going according to plan. The one thing I will give John Cena credit. I'm going to give you credit right now, buddy. 
is in his promo. He had the balls to say one line that I think kind of skipped under the radar for most people. But John Cena says tonight that he's here to save the WWE because they are on the fringe of losing the tiny bit of respect that the company even has left. Telling the world, yeah, they know they're losing viewers. They know their show sucks. The problem is that they don't care. They don't care enough to make new stars, which is why we got to get this guy in the first place. But Cena's promo was fantastic. I thought it was great. It did what it was supposed to do. It hyped up the crowd. He was uh, feeling sorry, I guess, for Cleveland by bringing up the fact that they had to change the name of the Cleveland Indians today. That's what I meant when I said controversial Cleveland in the news today for changing the baseball team's logo to the Guardians, which is why, if you were confused as to why John Cena said, I'm going to change my name to the Guardian, that's why he was being topical and he wanted to reference what was going on in Cleveland. Obviously, the fans came down and rained some booze over that fact, so I guess it's not very supported in Cleveland. And if you are from Cleveland and you're watching the show, let me know in the comments below. Or if you're a fan of the Cleveland Indians, you don't have to be from Cleveland to like that team. I don't know why you would, but that's another story, unless you're from Cleveland, in which I totally understand. Let me know how you feel about what's going down with your baseball team tonight in the comments section down below. Personally, I I don't think it's a big deal. I feel like, and this might be hot topic, but I, I don't really think so. It's just that image of the Indian is a cartoon image. It may be a caricature. I understand how some people could find it offensive, and I understand why they went about changing it. I'm not saying they should have changed it. I just think in this certain situation pertaining to this image, it's been beloved. It's not being used in a way to mock or shame the Native Americans of this world. I know it might be a little out of date maybe and that's why we're changing it but I, I certainly don't see how something that is beloved and liked and celebrated as the Cleveland Indians mascot was is being taken away but that's another story for another time let's get back to Smackdown which after Cena's segment which was made even better by the involvement of Paul Heyman. Of course, he calls out Roman Reigns. Roman isn't going to come out. We know Roman's not going to come out. But Paul E comes out and he does his Paul Heyman thing. And the best part, which was another highlight of the show, was when Paul Heyman completed his mission, which was to tell John Cena pretty much that Roman comes out on Roman's time and he's going to get his answer. But when Roman says so, which is what you probably expected Paul Lee to say, he walked off mocking Cena's entrance song. And he went and sang the song as he walked off. And John Cena just stood in the ring looking all dejected and all pissed off. And it was a good way to kick off the show. This was followed by a recap of... Finn Balor's return to SmackDown last week when he confronted Sami Zayn, interrupting him during his promo last week prior to Money in the Bank. Then, for some strange reason, I guess maybe to remind us that Sami Zayn is a formidable competitor and he's not just a big bag of wind coming out boring the shit out of most fans on Friday nights, they showed us Sami Zayn when he was victorious at the Clash of Champions in 2020 when he beat AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy. Just seemed a little random, a little out of place. Don't understand the need for it. But Sami Zayn and Finn Balor had a great match. This match went nearly 10 minutes long. Balor was absolutely great. This guy's body is fucking sick. It's, it's sick. It's like he was chiseled out of granite. He looks great. I loved this match. And it was elevated even more so by the investment of the crowd. Made even better by the extremely hot reactions throughout. These guys perform their asses off. Great match. So as of right now, SmackDown is off to a hippity-hoppity hot start. And I was enjoying myself thoroughly. Until... Then we had the first Baron Corbin segment. Where he told the world that the guy that made the GoFundMe page for Baron Corbin to try to 
get some donations to get him back on his feet from the fans, stole all the money and all of his money. And he stole his identity because he gave him all his information to make this GoFundMe page. So now that's another shot in the nuts to Baron Corbin, only figuratively speaking. And then he was like, oh, and I had to take the bus to SmackDown and it smelled on the bus and it was really bad and I just really didn't care. And we will continue not to care about anything that goes on with this guy. Then I was kind of excited because Big E came out. Big E, our Money in the Bank winner this year, comes out. He's probably going to say something of importance. And first it was originally announced that Big E was going to have a match with Apollo Crews at the Rolling Loud Festival, but that was obviously changed. But this was turned into a ridiculous and useless segment. Big E, instead of being allowed to relish in his victory, maybe tease what his prospective plans are in the future with the money in the bank, he talked a little bit about winning the ladder match right before Apollo Crews would come out to interrupt, obviously because they were scheduled for a match already. So I assume this was going to happen, but in Cleveland, not in Rolling Loud. But it got worse and worse by the minute, because one after the other, all these people came out. Before Apollo Crews and his ridiculous graphics were finished speaking, out came Dolph Ziggler and, and Bobby Roode, because Ziggler says, well, if you're going to talk about the Intercontinental Championships, you got to talk about us. Why? Because you were former Intercontinental Champions? Who gives a shit? You've been nowhere. You were the tag team champions for a blip a few months ago, and since then you've done dick. And now you want to dirty dog yourself on the SmackDown and stake some sort of a claim to the Intercontinental Championship? And then the Boogs came out and played Shinsuke Nakamura's theme out of tune on the electric guitar, which continues to just grate on my nerves. Shinsuke came out... And the fan singing the music is great. But then Cesaro came out. Shinsuke's former tag team partner. He came out and interrupted Shinsuke's entrance. And for whatever reason this was going on, Cesaro came out. And he says, he's here. And he wants the Intercontinental Championship. And then the time for talking is over. And it's swing time in Cleveland. Then there was a big brawl. And then we went to commercial. And... When we came back from commercial, they went to the Rolling Loud Festival in Miami, Florida. And here's something positive about what they did here. I really enjoyed the atmosphere of the Rolling Loud Festival around the wrestling. It just felt gritty. It felt organic. It felt really different. And it just, I think, added a nice element to... A pro wrestling match. The problem here is that they gave this crowd two matches, mid-card level for one of them, the other one a women's matchup featuring the SmackDown Women's Champion, and every time they cut to the crowd it just didn't seem like they gave a shit. Because if you're going to Rolling Loud, you're not coming to see pro wrestling. And while I'm sure there are some wrestling crowds there, I mean, some wrestling fans there in that crowd, I'm also fairly sure that a greater majority of them are just there for the concert. And even though Wale came out and introduced the Street Profits and Dawkins would have a match with Chad Gable here, this match only went about four minutes, and rightfully so, because you're taking away their concert time. But it just didn't seem to connect, and there just seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect. It it didn't ruin it for me, so to speak. I I liked the look of it. I thought it was a great aesthetic, and I think it was interesting, and at least it was something a little bit different. It reminded me a little bit back in the day when WCW would do things like Hog Wild or when they would have Monday Nitro from the beach somewhere. You know, it, it just changed it up just a little bit, and I didn't mind that. The crowd seemed to care more because the women came out, and I have a strange feeling as well that that was more just because they were women and not because they were going to be wrestling. Bianca Belair defeated Carmella 
shortly after Angelo Dawkins defeated Chad Gable. There were some chants going on in the crowd, but I don't think any of the chants were for any of the wrestlers involved. I'm not sure who they might have been chanting for. Maybe it was just for the show to continue. Maybe they wanted to get back to the music. I don't know, but it's, uh, it's not really that big of a deal. It's just something that you have to notice if you're watching the show. These people didn't give a shit, especially in the stark contrast of cutting back to the Cleveland crowd for the main show where the crowd was just on fire. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> the difference in fan participation. So there was that. But other than that, I didn't mind it. And I thought it was a good look. What did you think about WWE bringing us wrestling from Rolling Loud? And am I crazy? Or did you see as well that the, the fans just weren't into it? Comments are open for you guys, as always. Then we had the second of three great promos on, on this night. Edge came out. He wanted to confront Seth Rollins. He talked about all of the things that he used to be, said how he was once in the brood and once he was in the Ministry of Darkness and Edge has no idea the levels of which he will stoop to get a measure of vengeance for Seth Rollins getting involved. Actually, Edge also said something here that I said on this review prior to Money in the Bank. I, I said that it would be it would have been a better idea, I think, for Seth Rollins to attack Roman Reigns and put him at the disposition to allow Edge to win the title so that Edge would be an easier target for Seth Rollins to take down. Edge actually apparently felt the same way. And he said this exact thing on the show tonight because he thought Seth was stupid for, for doing what he did because now Roman's still the champion and nobody's going to get out uh, get at Roman Reigns right now. It's just pretty much a known fact. Nobody's taking that belt away from Roman. This prompted Seth to come out being dressed like Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber with this ridiculous blue suit, continuing Seth Rollins' silly fashion sense week after week. The only time the guy looks halfway decent is when he's in his wrestling gear. Otherwise, he looks like a clown. A clown in a ridiculous suit. And it's not helping him that he comes out and is all like, nah, 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 nah. now he's got this laughing thing. He took the laughing thing from Bailey since she's off TV. He's just going to laugh at everything. Everything's so funny. <laughs> You're an old man. <laughs> and then he confronts Edge face to face. They have a very good back and forth. Seth Rollins toned it down. He got a little bit serious. They, they played, well, they didn't play the clip because the big show would have been in it, but they mentioned back in 2014 when Seth Rollins almost curb stomped Edge when he came back as a guest at the time and he was not yet cleared to return, putting his career and life and livelihood at great risk. But Seth Rollins didn't pull the trigger. He did the right thing in that scenario. And now they're playing on that. And Rollins says this time he's not going to hold back. And although Edge promised Seth Rollins before he got into the ring that he wasn't going to lay a hand on him, this thing ends up with these two guys beating each other up because Edge says he's a liar. And he's, we all know that. The ultimate opportunist attacked Seth Rollins. Rollins avoided the spear, but then rolled out of the ring. The fans were hot into this. This was a very good segment. Once again, elevated by the crowd being so hot for it. It was perfect. Something that was not so perfect was the, the debut on SmackDown for Tony Storm. Now, Tony Storm, fantastic talent. I love her character. I loved her work in NXT. I thought she would have been called up by now, but when anybody gets called up at this point, I'm terrified, but I'm here to report that at the very least, Tony Storm got a win in her debut. The problem is she got that win against Zelina Vega, and Zelina Vega only just made her return to the WWE. You would think they would want to build her up before 
you start having people take her down because <clears throat> what does it really mean for Tony Storm to beat Azalina Vega, who's known more for being a manager on the WWE than anything else? Does it really give her credibility? Does it really give her anything? No, it's just a quick win. And sure, wins make you look good, but this was very bad for Zelina Vega's character. And she's already taken to Twitter, taken the, the, the general stance that wrestlers take when fans don't like the way they're being booked. And they're like, well, you know, my bank account's great. You know, so I, that's the, just the standard comeback. It's like, yeah, I hope your bank account is reflecting your booking because I have a feeling that we're not going to ever see Zelina Vega win now that Aleister Black is Malachi Black over on the other show. And I feel very icky when I watch Zelina Vega losing because I feel like it's just, it's just punishment for something that she really has no involvement with. It's just the decision of her husband to go elsewhere and now she's going to be stuck like Lana. How long is it going to be before they start putting her through tables week in and week out? I hope that's not the case. And I'm glad at the very least she's getting paid well to be booked so poorly at the end of the day. The one other thing that I noticed is that they changed Tony Storm's finishing moves name. It was famously known as the Storm Zero which is a very cool name, the Storm Zero. And why would you even call it that? Well, because when you hit this storm, it means your lights are out. Boom. Zero. It's the end for you. That's great. I loved it. You know what doesn't make sense? Changing the name by changing the number from zero to one. Tony Storm hits the Storm One. The Storm One? Is this a finishing move or Channel 4's fucking weathered satellite traveling overhead in orbit? Oh, it's the Storm 1. What? Ridiculous. Why do they got to change anything? No matter who it is from NXT, they got to change something. They either take part of your name away or they change your look. They change your music. I gotta change something about you. With Tony Storm, everything was there and everything looked like it was staying in place. And then she hits her finishing move and they call it the Storm One. Now, this very easily could have just been a mistake by Michael Cole because, you know, it's Michael Cole and he makes lots of mistakes. And I hope that's the case, that his research was wrong and he just said it wrong. But if, if it sticks, then we know that they changed the name for good. And I love that move. It's a great looking move. I just think that changing the name for the hell of it is just kind of stupid, right? Why, why change the name of her move? What is the motivation behind that? Do you feel like it's a negative connotation because it's a zero? What the hell does that have to do with anything? Fucking ridiculous. Then we had Jimmy Uso with Jay Uso taking on Dominic Giant baby man son Mysterio and his tiny dad in the corner. I'm going to support you, son, no matter what. And while this was a pretty good, pretty fun match, Dominic looked great here. The fans, again, were into this. They had a pretty decent reaction throughout the entirety of the match. I feel like having Dominic continue to lose in such a consistent fashion is just being detrimental to his character. Sure, he's still new. Sure, he still needs some work in the ring. But at some point, this kid's got to win without his dad, right? Now, he may have won here and there. Like, uh, it's just in this moment, not that he should be beating Jimmy Uso. He just should be being booked differently. You know, take take them out of the tag thing. Make Ray his manager and, and move along. If you're not going to have them break apart and feud and have Rey Mysterio put his boy over, then make him be the manager. Make them stay a loving father-son duo and, and put him over and get him to where he needs to be. Don't just feed him to people so that Jimmy Uso could get a win. And essentially, this here is just a rematch of a storyline that's been going on for so long with these teams and this whole thing it's been going on for like the last month month and a half it's just more of the same 
It's Monday Night Raw Syndrome. We don't really know what to do, so we'll just give you what we gave you last week, only we'll change it just so slightly from a tag team match to a singles match, and all will be all will be saved. All will be well. Not so much. They did, however, mess up on the finish pretty badly. Jimmy was supposed to catch him in a Samoa drop. It just didn't really work. It was a big botch at the end of this match. Other than that, it was decent for the most part. But all we were waiting for throughout this entire show was Roman Reigns' answer to John Cena. Which brings out the big dog. And the fans, as always, are doing their job. They're making me proud. Because as many people are big fans of Roman Reigns in this character, I know many of you are not, but many of you are on board with the tribal chief and acknowledge him the way he wants to be acknowledged it's important that you boo his ass and the fans did the right thing as cleveland came to play tonight and they were a very refreshing very hot crowd very nice uh, nicely done all night long in fact they would have a huge impact so to speak in something that would be going down at the end of this segment. Roman tore down John Cena pretty good. This was probably Roman Reigns' best promo of his life. He called out John Cena for coming back, saying that he thought Hollywood would have changed him and he was going to get some new, better version of John Cena, but instead we got the same John Cena coming out to the same music, giving us the same promo, doing the same thing, wearing the same outfit, and pretty much called him out for being Roman Reigns. Because that was our biggest criticism of the big dog up until he changed to being a heel in this Tribal Chief character. For years, that was the criticisms that we were throwing his way, and now he's taken everything we've ever said about him and thrown them directly in the face of the man that you cannot see. And I thought that was great. That was great. He wanted Cleveland to acknowledge him, but they would not, and they booed Roman Reigns out the building. He then turned to the camera and asked me and you and everybody watching at home to acknowledge him, in which the fans for us booed once again. It was very, very good. And then he called out Cena for just being a nostalgia act. And then he compared watching John Cena to having sex. He says that what he what John Cena brings to the table is no different than having the missionary position every single night over and over and over again, which was a fucking great line. Great line. And Roman says that he can't see Cena. But he doesn't want to see Cena, and he's not going to see Cena in the main event at SummerSlam because his answer is no. To which, out of nowhere, not Randy Orton, but Finn Balor's music hits. Finn Balor comes out to the ring. Roman thinks Finn's there to acknowledge him as his champion. But Finn Balor is not there to acknowledge him. He's there to challenge him. He says, well, since you're not going to be busy with John Cena, how about you accept my challenge? Which busted the fans out in a minor yes chant, and Roman seemed reluctant to face Finn Balor. He wasn't giving him an answer at first, but then the fans started to scream, Roman scared. Roman scared. Roman scared. And this really got under the skin of the big dog and played perfectly into the story that they were about to tell, as he would then accept Finn Balor's proposal, and we are going to get a match between them. Is it going to be at SummerSlam? Who knows? Is it going to be next Friday? Probably, because they're stupid enough to do something like that, but Michael Cole goes off the air saying, oh, are we going to have a, a match Finn and Roman? Yeah, that's pretty much what just happened. When, where, why, we don't know. Well, why, we kind of know, because Finn laid out the challenge. And this was a great way to, to go off the air. The only couple of things we got to bring the hammer down on is, one, why the fuck didn't John Cena come out? What, did he give his opening promo, get shut down by Paul E, and go the fuck home? He left? What is he doing? I expected that whole time for John Cena to come out, but they swerved us, and they gave us Finn Balor instead. Now, I'm okay with this to a point, because Finn Balor... 
is being elevated to the main event, which I guess he should be, former NXT champion. He just kind of got killed by Cross before he came to the main roster. But feeding him to Roman so quickly, when he's clearly just a a speed bump, if you will, to the bigger match that they're planning. Is there a pay-per-view in between that I'm unaware of? I don't think so. Are they going to have some sort of a special or something? Are they going to have this title match on SmackDown just to appease some of the Fox Network's executives since everything goes on pay-per-view on Peacock? I I don't know what the purpose here is. And Finn Balor has just come back. He's just starting to get his footing again, but they're going to feed him to Roman and Roman's going to beat him. So why would you have Finn Balor beat Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship before John Cena gets his hands on him. It wouldn't make much sense. It takes a lot away from Roman versus Cena if Finn wins. So there's no chance that Finn is winning. So losing to Roman is just a small step in extinguishing the momentum that he has just now built by having his first very good match on SmackDown. And now he's on this other trajectory. I just don't quite understand the logic here. And why John Cena went home. If your whole purpose was to come to SmackDown to confront Roman Reigns, I wouldn't have left until I seen him. But Roman gets away with this one. I'm I'm a little confused about where they're going with it. But we're going to get a good match. Finn and Roman are, are good opponents. It's just funny to me though, because Roman doesn't think John Cena is worthy. John Cena is just a nostalgia act. But out comes Finn Balor, and he's got the same music, and he's pretty much got the same look. But I guess he was just different enough because, you know, he's not the demon anymore. He's the prince. He calls himself the prince, and he's got the X on the C, which is weird. And I don't know why that's a thing, but, you know, it is. And, and, don't forget, he's wearing blue now since he's on SmackDown. So, you know, big color change. So that's a whole different persona it's not a nostalgia act for finn balor no not at all he's worthy but john cena is not so maybe the fans are onto something and roman is scared we'll have to stay tuned to see what this is all about and before we sign off while baron corbin continues to get the poop hammer which you know is a foregone conclusion, I must say thank you for this once again. (laughs) Oh, it's joy. It's a joy. It's just a happy joy time when I see that clip. (laughs) Not that I relish in other people's pain, because, you know, that would be wrong. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for joining me here for this review of SmackDown after Money in the Bank as we are on our way to SummerSlam, I assume. And things are getting weird. So stick around as we continue to bring you coverage every single week. In order to do that, you need to be subscribed. So become part of Sledge Nation right now by hitting that subscribe button. Smash that like button if you enjoyed today's show. If you liked my Baron Corbin clip, if you liked anything about today's show at all, that's what the thumbs up is there for. Smash it real hard with your hammers at home because it really helps my channel out. Great way to support the channel. Another great way is to go down and check out the merch link in the description section below. If you got a few extra bucks, you're back at work. We're all kind of going back to business again. So maybe you got some extra ducats and maybe you want to share it with your favorite podcaster. And I can give you a t-shirt if you want to give me some money for it. (laughs) Plus some other stuff as well. The merchandise link is in the description below. Thank you all for your continued love and support. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, his tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue, the Yeti microphone, the most important member of the team, as always, each and every one of you. That, my friends, is going to do it tonight. If you missed anything at all, it'll be linked in the annotations up above, and don't forget to share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, just like you are one of my wrestling buddies. 
I'm sure you have other ones. Make sure they come and join us here. Because we need more friends. And we need more people to carry the hammer. As we bring it down on the WWE like nobody else. That's going to do it. We are out of here. And we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show. Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. Only on Sledgehammer TV. Right here on YouTube.com. Boom. Click. Click.